So hello everybody. Thank you for joining this fire chat, the fireside chat with uh, Professor Lin. My name is Carlos Gadin, and I'm a research fellow at Uno Wider here at Helsinki. And we are here today to have a chat with uh, Professor Lin. Professor Lin, he's a member of the UNU Wider Board. He also served in many relevant academic and professional positions related with economic development. I would have highlight among them his role as professor as at Pe Peking University. He is the dean of the Institute of New Structural Economics. He founded the China Center for Economic Research, now the National School of Development. And I will also highlight that he served as chief economist and senior vice president of the World Bank between 2008 and 2012. So uh, the chat is going to be um, informal. We will try to uh, see how development economics can be useful to trigger actual development in the uh, most vulnerable countries. This is an informal session, so please feel free to participate in the discussion using the Q&I. Um, and I, 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 please feel, feel free to uh, address your comments or questions. So uh, let me start uh, with a personal question. So in, in one of your books, The Quest of, for Prosperity, uh, you confessed that you became an economist as a way of contributing to the prosperity of your country so that people would be free from poverty and hunger, something that uh, you can relate to as a child. With the rich background of having served these academic and professional positions, uh, do you still believe that economists in general, but particularly development economies can have such an impact on improving people's lives in the developing world? Well, thank you very much, Carlos, for this very good question. You know, I am an educated youth, and it's a privilege. And I just like educated elites in any country. They feel the responsibility for the development and the prosperity in their country. And certainly, I have the same internal drive as any educated young people in other countries. And in terms of making a country pros prosperous, we know that economics is the best discipline to turn to. Because the first book published by Adam Smith to make economics a sub-discipline in our social you know, sciences is the wealth of nation. And try to have an inquiry, inquiry into the nature of the causes of the wealth of the nation. And since Adam Smith, I think the main theme of economics is to understand the nature and the causes of the wealth of nation in a country. So if I want to you know, make a contribution to the prosperity of my nation, certainly economics is the best in uh, social sciences for me to study, to do research, and so, yes. But whether economists can make a contribution to the development of their country, it all depends. If economists that can provide you know, right ideas for the policies in their country, certainly they can make uh, tremendous contributions. Because if you look what happened in China in the past you know, 40 years, 
when China started the transition from a planned economy to a market economy, China was one of the poorest country in the world. China was trapped in poverty for centuries, but with the right policies, within one generation, now China becomes one country which eradicates the extreme, extreme poverty and growing dynamically and living, you know, improving people's lives. And so it all depends on you can provide the right ideas or not. But idea is not so easy to get, just like Ken said. It is ideas, not vested interest, which are dangerous for good or evil. If you have the right ideas, you can turn the country around and from poverty to prosperity. But if you cannot have the right ideas, you can turn a prosperous country into a country which you know, hit by crises all the time. And so, yes, I believe. And so that's the reason why I try to work hard to explore what are the right ideas for a country to turn from you know, uh, 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 poverty to prosperity. And I hope I can pro you know, I can contribute to the understanding of those kind of ideas. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, going into a bit more detail about your economic um, uh, thinking. So your main approach to economic development, as I understand, is based on uh, what you called uh, the new structural economics, right? right? So at the risk of maybe oversimplifying what probably is something more complex, uh, this is an approach that advocates for an active use of industrial policy, uh, as opposed to like the Washington Consensus, for example, no? And this should be based on experience, no? And identifying what are the strengths in a country and trying to relate these strengths to past successful experiences in other similar countries. But obviously there is a risk, you know, that wrong industrial policies can be very expensive and ineffective. So not all industrial policies will be successful. Uh, what is the recipe for economic prosperity in the least developed countries, in your view? Okay, it's a very crucial question because we can observe the history. In the modern times, since the 15th, 16th century, and we find no, you know, without industrial policy, no developing country can catch up the other one's country. And as so without industrial policy, no advanced country can continue to maintain their prosperity. And, 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 and so, but certainly as you mentioned, there are so many countries try to implement industrial policy and uh, most of them fail. And so it's very important for us to understand why industrial policy is essential for the developing country to catch up, for the developed country to maintain their leadership. But at the same time, we also need to understand why most industrial policy fail. From the new structural economics that you just mentioned, the nature of economic development is a process of continuous structural transformation in the production structure, that is technology structure and industrial structure. But 
also the in the infrastructure and the institutional structure. It's a process of structural transformation. And in this process, the structural transformations, certainly you need to have entrepreneurs to have the incentive to have the drive to capture the opportunity for technological innovation and industrial upgrading. But at the same time, you know, there are so many barriers in the hard infrastructure and the institutional structure. And that if those kind of structures without improvement, they will become barriers for technological innovation and the industrial upgrade. And so we need to overcome the infrastructure barrier and institutional barriers. And in those areas, use our term, you need to coordination. We have coordination. There are externalities. So market values is there. So you need to have a state to help overcome the bottleneck of structural transformation in high infrastructure and institutional structure. Uh, structure. And, but the government resources is limited, both implementation capacity as well as the physical space are limited. So the state needs to prioritize the use of its limited implementation capacity as well as physical space to unleash the infrastructure and the institution barriers for the industry which can make a largest impact on the countries in our job generation, export in our uh, 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 earnings and a growth and a competitiveness. And if the government does not play that role, then a developing country will not be able to catch up. A developed country will not be able to maintain its you know, advancement. But during this process, the countries will have to you know, rely on what they have not. What are their competitive advantages? And turn their competitive advantages from latent to actual. The competitive advantage is determined by factor endowments in technology and industries, only determining the production costs. But if you want to be actual, were to be competitive on the market. It's a competition of the total costs. Total cost includes not only the production cost arising from the factory inputs, but also from transaction costs, which are determined by the infrastructure, the appropriateness of the infrastructure and institutions. If infrastructure and institutions are not appropriate, the transaction cost will be too high. And then even looking into the production cost, the sectors, the industries, the countries has competitive advantage, but they cannot be competitive. So those kind of industry may not exist at all. So they only determine the latent competitive advantage. But if you want to turn the latent into actions, you need to have industrial policy. And, and if a country's industrial policy follow those kind of basic principle in economics, you know, and also in the new structure economics, the country can develop very dynamically. But unfortunately, because in the mainstream theory, basically, they do not have the ideas of structure as endogenous. They do not have the ideas of country at a different stage of development. 
they have different industrial structure and technology structure. And as a way, as a, as a result, you know, the economists often advise the developing country follow the practice in the developed country to develop those kind of protection activities like in the developed country. But those kind of protection activities are not consistent with the competitive advantage of the developing country. And uh, as a result, the production cost will be too high. Or we'll only look into further institution in high income country. And I'll advise the developing country to adopt the same institutions as in the high income country. And uh, as a result, that kind of institution may not work in the developing country. And, uh, and, uh, and, and also developing country themselves need to be blamed because sometimes they are too ambitious. They want to catch up the advanced country in one strike. And so they want to you know, have the same industries, they have the same technology, the same institutions as in the advanced country. And uh, those kind of attempt with good intention, but may not work. That's what I see from the theory of the new structural economics. So my basic, my basic moral is that you need to look at what you have now, based on what you have, what you can do well, what you have is your endowment structure, what you can do well is your latent compared advantages. Then relying on the entrepreneurs and the state or the market and the state to scale up what you can do well with the government facilitation by the targeted industrial policy. If the country can do that, every country can grow dynamically like China in the past four years. I cannot hear you. Maybe you need to turn on. Yeah, Sorry, uh, thank you very much for, for your explanation. We have a, a question from the audience, Ellen uh, Wang Yemi. Do you want to write the question yourself? You can request um, to share your audio and video. Okay, otherwise I can um, uh, raise the question. So she's, uh, Ellen is asking, how important is the role of trade in reducing poverty in China? And should China be classified as a developed country instead of a developing country under the WTO? Uh, trade certainly is important because as I mentioned, if a country wants to be successful, they should follow the competitive advantages determined by their endowment structure. And if they have the competitive advantage in these industries, and with the government facilitation to turn that into their actual competitive advantages, certainly their product not only can be competitive in domestic market, they can also be competitive in the global market. And also in the modern manufacturing, we know that economy scale is very large. So if you only do that on the domestic economies, you may not be able to exploit the potential of the you know, economy scales and your production costs will be high. So under the kind of situation, certainly you should export whatever goods that you have complete advantages to the global market and trade is important for that. And the trade is important also, it gives you the opportunity to understand what is available in the world and you can you know, learn from the successful country and especially by the late commercial advantages. Trade is important for that. However, in the 1980s, 1990s, many countries turned from the inward looking development strategy to the you know, export oriented strategies during the you know, structural adjustment in the 1980s, 1990s, those countries failed dramatically. And they faced the issue of deindustrialization instead of 
continuous dynamic, uh, you know, upgrading in the industry. And the main reason was because in the transition from an import substitution strategies, which deny the role of trade to the, you know, export oriented development strategies, they forgot there were many older industries which went against their country's competitive advantages. And if you open up the trade without giving protection to those kind of industries, those kind of industries collapse. But at the same time, in the 1980s, 1990s, the main idea was neoliberalism and uh, go against the country to use industrial policy to facilitate the growth of new industry which are consistent with their comparative advantages. And so that's the reason why trade often caused the industrialization in African country, in Latin America country. But however, a country followed the, you know, the more pragmatic approach or new structural economics in the transition process, continue to provide the necessary protection and subsidies to the old sector, which you know, defied their competitive advantage and to maintain stability but at the same time to facilitate the entry to the new industries, which are consistent with their comparative advantages, then they can enjoy stability and dynamic growth as in China, as in Vietnam, as in Laos. So trade is important. If you have the right knowledge and have to use the trade to facilitate growth. And the bigger challenge is a middle-income country would not. It depends on definition. According to the United Nations, IMF, and the World Bank. And now the threshold for the high income country is 12,535 uh, US dollar per capita GDP. And, and currently, China's per capita GDP is about you know, 11,000. So, China, according to this definition, China is still a developing country, certainly a high developing country. But I'm sure within three or four years, China will cross the three hole and China will be a high income country. Things change fast, yeah. So we have another question, maybe the last one, for, because we don't have much time, but uh, Carlo uh, Pietrobelli is asking, dear Justin, uh, what to do when a developing country does not have the kind of efficient and effective government promoting development that you have described? Well, it depends on, you know, the government capacity very not depends on, very much depends on what kind of thing you ask the government to do. If you advise the government to follow the approach I recommended in the new structural economics, every country can do it. Because fundamentally, you know, if you try to facilitate the sector which you have latent compared advantages. In early stage, it's very level intensive. And uh, infrastructure requirements certainly need to it. But you can help use some kind of enclave approach. Build up export processing zone within the zone. You have the good infrastructure within the zone. You remove all the distortions. And, uh, and, and, and if those kind of very pragmatic approach Every country has sufficient capacities because compared to improve the education for the whole nation, improve the, 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 the health for the whole nation, improve the transparency for the whole nation, improve the governance for the whole nation. My approach, it's much easier to implement. Every country has the capacity to do that. And I can give you one historical artifact. In 1970s, in 1970s, World Bank gave a grant to the Korea government in order to send their official to study, to learn how to design policy, implement policy in Pakistan. So that means what? In 1970s, Korea was considered as a country with low 
government capability. And of Kazakhstan was a country, you know, a considered as a model country, can teach other developing country how to have the state capacity. But Korea is extremely successful. And Pakistan has been trapped in you know, low middle income status since the 1970s. So whether the state capacity from what I see is important to what kind of policy you advise the government to do, what kind of ideas you offer the government to do. Okay, thank you very much. Clearly the state capacity is also endogenous no? and it's something right. that can change uh, during the development uh, process. So uh, thank you very much. I think we reached uh, uh, the time limit we had. So thank you very much for this um, quick uh, uh, overview of development and how development can change uh, people's life. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lin. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, you know, she hope you enjoy it. And if you are interested, please read my and our writings on the new structural economics. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all of you who have participated and address us uh, your questions or uh, follow with interest this, uh, this uh, chat. Thank you very much. Thank you.